Thank okay, you. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is or try to do in the short time is is describe some of the new results that came through about two years ago for the end of the dawn mission at the uh, Okotora crater, which has some interesting hydrothermal deposits. And by a quirk of fate, actually, the Nature Papers is a collection of about seven nature in the various Nature Journal collection that are, are due to be released on Monday uh, by a quirk of fate. Uh, so I want everybody to raise their right hand and swear. I will not share, well, actually, I'm not going to go that far, but um, I would be grateful if you'd not share any of the photographs until Monday, okay? You can talk about it, whatever. It actually might spread some of the buzz, as it were. Anyway, so what we're talking about is the second extended mission phase of the DAWN mission, which was uh, designed to orbit both Vesta and Ceres uh, in, uh, in a sequence. And this extended mission phase included uh, mapping at better than five meters per pixel over the oak crater, which you see here in the image. This is actually one of the, the mosaics that we produced from that. And uh, it was a design to focus on hydrothermal uh, carbonate and melt deposits on the floor of the crater. And it just told me my internet collection. So if my voice goes out, let me know. Uh, and those kinds of deposits, thermal and impact melt deposits, for not only into the chemistry and geology of this uh, peculiar dwarf, which is ice ridge, but also for putative environments and water on the Earth. Now, Ceres, so there's a couple of background slides here. Ceres has low density, water rich, uh, uh, water ice rich, rather, outer shell, uh, which is also silicates and there may be a subcrust that enriched in brine the substantial evidence uh, certainly evidence for brines in terms of but overlying a deep mantle of hydrated this is of course very different from Mars which is also water rich but uh, but less so in terms of crustal structure uh, more than the ice shell might be composed of ices or clathrates of the, the constraint the outer shell are derived from the orbital mapping of the shell gravity to a high degree precision by the by the dawn space set. Now the impact models uh, uh, that resulted from the mapping phase of the mission, which was global coverage, demonstrated that uh, at the Expect impact velocities of about five kilometers, per second, which is lower than the moon or Mars. That you can get water that persists in this zone here, in the central zone, uh, for a, a, a hundred thousand years or so, roughly, uh, depending, of course, on the exact composition impact, those other factors that go in, and that parts of the floor. Uh, parts of the uh, crust under, immediately under the floor could also stay warm uh, for protracted periods of, uh, of time. And there are some more recent models, ways to make it last longer than that. But I'm not going to get into that right now uh, during this talk. So uh, we expect there to be uh, the water ice to not hang out the salt matter. So what you get that an intimate mixture during the impact of the water water with the uh, on silicates materials form of the impact melts slurry. We have to keep that as we go along with the entire talk. Uh, so uh, activity or Planet. It's pretty remarkable, actually, when you think about it. We've seen the Earth. Obviously, we've met large craters. Uh, of Gordon. That. 
And we also see evidence for altered minerals on Mars, and, and I'm not going to talk too much about that, but uh, the Hello. I think we have I think we lost him. We may have lost Paul, yes, because yeah. the, the connection started to decay there. So we'll wait. Okay. Am I back? Yes. We can hear uh, you, yeah. We okay. can hear I'm you. Whether somebody else in the house has uh, is using the internet. Um, okay, I'm gonna turn my video off to reduce that risk. Okay, uh, sounds so good. I'll Thank you. Back. Where did I drop off? Here? Or there? Uh, there. Okay. I think even next slide. We we've heard some of some of the. Yeah, I can move on. I can move on. It's pretty self-explanatory. Okay. Um, hydrothermal activity is we're able to map it on series uh, on a dwarf planet, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, and here you see a diagram showing uh, where hydrothermal activity occurred. Uh, typically on, a, on an earth crater, and this is from a Gordon Osinski uh, Icarus paper. And uh, the problem with earth, of course, is that the upper layers are always eroded off of large complex craters, so we don't know what happened on the surface. But here on Ceres, we have that in the well-preserved Okator crater. Uh, so uh, this is a diagram which shows the topographic map of Ceres, the, the incompleteness, in uh, from the orbital mapping mission. And the red dots, uh, or lines if you will, map the uh, orbital trace of the uh, orbits during the extended mission. And they were all focused on Okator Crater, which is inside the blue circle here, because that was our primary target. And towards the end of the phase, it began to drift off due to uh, uh, periapsis drift, drift. In fact, it moved far to the south and we were able to map the large degraded crater Uvara down here as well. And then right around that time, uh, the spacecraft depleted its hydrazine and that was the end of the mission. So we never got any high resolution data on, uh, to the east, which is uh, lots of interesting targets there. Okay, so I, I like to refer to Okator as the Tycho of the asteroid belt. It's a large crater, 92 kilometers in size, very well preserved, uh, estimated to be less than two, uh, 20 million years. Uh, and it's by far the, the best preserved large crater on Ceres. Uh, and it has these uh, bright deposits which have been spectrally identified as, as uh, sodium carbonate uh, uh, with a little bit of salts mixed in as well. And that's of course important because sodium uh, carbonates are, are uh, uh, basically require a hydrothermal environment. So we got uh, about three quarters of this crater mapped at 3.5 to 6.5 meter pixel scales, and almost all of it was in stereo. And from that, we were able to generate high resolution topographic maps, which is what uh, a lot of the work that I did for the project. We also got uh, 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 improvement of the gravity map by a factor 40 over the crater, and an elemental abundance from the Grand uh, as well. Now this, just, this is the basic geologic map from uh, orbital mapping, showing the outline of the crater and the various types of floor deposits we have. And we're gonna focus in on the unit inside the blue outline, which is a, what we call a lobate floor deposit. It's basically a large contiguous impact melt structure. Uh, for up to 400 meters uh, thick in some places and possibly thicker. Uh, it has a classic impact melt distribution. It embays terraces and, and uh, uh, does other sorts of things like that. So it's pretty classic in terms of its general plan form. This, so this is an enlargement of the uh, XM2 uh, mosaic at, projected at 3.5 meters per pixel. You can see it's got most, it's characterized mostly by low relief. And these here are some buried terraces that are just poking up above it, the, these, these low hills here on the, on the top, lower left and upper right. Uh, and then the rim down here at the south, of course. You see isolated knobs, uh, and we'll look at some of those in a few moments. Most of them look like classic impact debris uh, mounds that you see in lunar craters. Uh, you see a couple inward facing scarps, which are sort of interesting here. Uh, and you see that the 
this, this low bait floor deposit, this intact melt sheet, if you will, uh, is perched at different levels. It's low here and then uh, you know, the classic uh, color coding for topography is, uh, is used here. Uh, that it uh, is perched up at this higher level, it actually stops here and then uh, drops down again, and that's higher up here as well. So, uh, and we see that all along the rim, basically, lots of uh, perched uh, impact melt deposits all over the place. In some cases, uh, this is uh, something we weren't expecting to find uh, in the XM2 day, is that a large, even beyond this unit, many areas of the crater are mantled by this thin resistant layer, which seems to have this uh, like the resistant scarp along it here. This is a terrace block, uh, the top of a terrace block here, and there's the bottom along here with the scarp there. Uh, so a lot of the units seem to be capped by this uh, resistant layer, which is a few meters thick. Uh, and then some areas you actually see flow, in this case, what looks like a, a flow of this material going through this gap. Uh, in the terrace and probably some down here as well. And then you see a little cone, if you will, of uh, material down by the bottom of that. Uh, so all this is consistent with lobate floor morphologies. In fact, throughout the crater, we see these uh, lobate flows, which have a, a somewhat thicker morphology than, a, than, than uh, 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 like, like a basalt, for example. Uh, like, like these uh, lobate flow here, uh, sorry, these lobate flows are a couple hundred meters thick uh, from the topography. And there are several op overlapping uh, examples, uh, one on top of each other. Here's one on the western rim that comes down through a gap, and then you can see the ripples on the flow coming down here as another one. And they're scattered all around the crater in various uh, positions. So there's plenty of impact melt flow going on around the crater. You see lots of other uh, features uh, different types scattered around, and I'm just going to run through these really quickly uh, and wait for the bell. Uh, you see these uh, ring moat craters, which are very shallow in structure. Uh, I'll talk briefly about those later on. These mounds, which I've, I mentioned before, some of them look like classic uh, uh, large boulders and blocks and stuff like that. They're, they're thrown out during the course of the impact. Some, some of them have this crested uh, ma uh, top. And, uh, uh, and then there's these scarps and these uh, other dark knobs here. Sinuous troughs and, uh, with pits along their length. In fact, this one has like what appears to be a, a flow coming out of it uh, uh, going to either side. And then we're going to look at this one here uh, later on, another fracture with a small pit on the side and a mound. And these scabby units and then clusters of pits like this. And then again, the low bait floor. So there's a wide range of, of morphologies related to this. This is uh, that cluster of pits. They're almost certainly not impact related because they have these fractures associated with them. There's some sort of outgassing going on here probably. And this just shows the level of topographic detail we can get from these structures. Uh, and this is another very interesting structure. There's this scarp uh, fracture uh, system here going through, basically it looks like it's connecting this split knob here and then going off to the side. And then you have this, uh, this irregular uh, uh, pit or depression, not sure exactly what it is, it's actually very shallow, but it's got bright uh, features in the center of it, which were not unfortunately resolved, uh, but probably uh, evidence of outgassing or deposition of uh, carbonates. Then a low mound immediately to the south of it, and that's this mound is unusual in that it has a bright and yellowish color compared to the other ones which do not have that color. That indicates that um, some have called these pingos and maybe they are pingos, but maybe they're not because you don't have the freeze thaw cycle. But they do indicate um, uplift uh, of material that, that has a different composition than the surrounding area. So there might be some groundwater activity related to that. And we can develop a scenario for that where you have the, uh, a, uh, basically a large impact melt sheet, which actually is, is not symmetric on the crater floor. There are areas where it's not covered. And then it moved down to the south. But you also have, we have independent evidence that there were self-secondaries on the floor of the crater. And some of them impacted, and we think those form those ring moat craters, those shallow craters, because if you impact an impact melt, it's not going to be able to support a classic uh, crater morphology. 
and then it withdrew, uh, partially withdrew as it moved to the uh, north in this case, stranding uh, material up in the terraces and on isolated knobs forming the resistant units. And then as it solidified, there was chemical and petrological evolution that led to uh, localized outgassing or effusion of material onto the surface, either as flows or as, as bright carbonates or, or the formation of pits. So it's an evolving concept, uh, and we're still thinking about what it, uh, uh, how to explain all these features, but that's one idea. And we can compare this to Mars. Uh, on the left, image, left set of images, we have several of the examples I pointed out in series. And on the right, you have Mars. Mars is famous in its freshest craters, such as Tooting and Zunio Mojave, of having these densely spaced, large-scale pits all over the surface of the floor of these craters. You can see them especially up here in the upper, upper part of that image, and then over here in this area and this area. And uh, it's just very common morphology that you see. And these are usually attributed to sort of like volatile explosions or, or rapid venting that occurs uh, as the impact melt is solidifying. I'm beginning to wonder whether that's the, the right interpretation, but we don't actually see that on the floor of Okator Crater. We see these isolated small pits and sinuous channels and maybe a, some outflow and then some of the mounds that might be related to uh, movement of volatiles on the surface. And here's some more irregular pits here. It's just a very different style on the two bodies. And we're not really sure why that would be. Uh, Ceres is the more water-rich target, but it could be that water is sequestered differently or that the volatiles are released in a different way on, on the Ceres, uh, uh, on the floor of Okator. So I'd actually welcome some input on that uh, as well. So we want to talk briefly, and I'll try to get through this as quickly as possible, the bright carbonate materials. Uh, this is, I'm going to focus on the Vanalia facula bright spots, which are in the eastern, uh, the center of the eastern floor of Okator, the central pit structure is just off to the left, right about here somewhere. And you see there's like five, or, I'm sorry, about 10 or so uh, dense concentrations uh, of bright material of these carbonates, uh, but they're diffuse, uh, and we're going to take a closer look at that. On the right is the uh, high resolution topographic map derived from the XM2 data. You can see just on the re left hand side the orbital uh, topographic map, which is much lower in resolution. So you can see that we actually got a lot of information out of, out of the stereo data on this. Uh, I will note that this uh, entire region is a uh, part of the impact melt sheet, it's got a ridged texture to it. Uh, you can see some of that here that's um, kind of knotted up. Knotted up. Uh, and the amplitude on these ridges is about 150 meters. This is a close-up uh, at full resolution on some of these bright spots. Uh, this is one of the western ones that has this sort of um, starfish-like pattern here. You can see it's actually composed of multitudes of small spots. Uh, and then some. there's actually some ribbons of bright material that go up canyons or over ridges. Uh, and, and then over on the right side, you see a more densely spaced or more contiguous deposit uh, that is more uniform. And then you actually see a late stage fracture cutting in uh, as well. But you also notice that there's lots of small craters on these deposits, which indicates they're relatively old, or at least as old probably as the, um, let me rephrase that. It's difficult to distinguish them in age from the uh, impact melt sheet itself. Uh, which gives you uh, some slack in terms of how old uh, that, that, that they could be, several thousands to hundreds of thousands of years. And we don't have the sensitivity because these are very small areas and the crater counts uh, have large uncertainties to them in terms of their derived age. Uh, these deposits, particularly the ones on, on the west or on the left in this view, are st strongly controlled by local topography. And here's... Uh, a view of these uh, western spots that show the uh, uh, three, uh, three of them. And if you look closely, you can see that they're actually in lows and that they actually kind of line the lows. They don't fill them as in a bathtub, but they actually sort of line them 
uh, as if they were just deposited locally and then there was no filling. There is actually a correlation. You can actually see there's a correlation between the elevation uh, and the cross section that I show. Uh, this is the low and then there's the albedo or the apparent brightness shows where the bright deposit is and actually corresponds pretty tightly to this low but you actually don't see it in these lows. So there's lots of lows in between the ridges that have no deposits whatsoever. So it's highly, the effusion of the brines that created these was localized, but also may have had local gradients that was driven by the local topography. Uh, so um, what we basically concluded is that there are thousands of individual brine sources uh, that brought the brines to, to the surface uh, through the impact fractured break bedrock uh, and you see those individual spots and most of them only created just spots that were like a couple hundred meters wide but in larger centers they tend to form thicker more contiguous layers uh, presumably because the outflow or the volume of brine was was more uh, was larger or, or more uh, longer in duration so you could build up a contiguous layer over a larger area. Uh, the hydrothermal brines were maintained by residual impact heat in the center probably as long as 100,000 years, but there's indications that there are ways to do that uh, for longer if you uh, make different assumptions about the, the bulk chemistry of, of the crust and other factors. Uh, we don't know the, we, we don't really see very much evidence of uh, deformation after the uh, uh, production of the uh, carbonates. Uh, I didn't talk about the central structure, but there is a dome in the center which is fractured, and we think maybe that happened after it was in place. But other than that, uh, there are deep fractures that run through, but the fractures did not produce the uh, carbonates. Uh, so this is the last slide uh, that I have, and then after that, if time permits, I have some 3D images, and if not, then you'll just have to wait. Um, so we have mantling and infilling of the floor and terraces uh, by um, impact melt deposits. Uh, and on that, on those deposits, and actually on the floor itself, uh, even if there is no uh, impact melts on those areas, you do see widely scattered endogenic pits sinuous troughs, and oftentimes you see them together, uh, but not, all, not always, sometimes they're separate. You have bright mounds as well, uh, and they're best explained by the evolution of the impact melt deposits and the shallow interior beneath the crust due to the heat of the impact driving volatiles to the surface. The carbonates at Vanellia facula form from hydrothermal brine effusion at multitudes of small events, coalescing together to form more contiguous deposits where they're more active and more, uh, the, the effusion was a larger volume and, and greater uh, duration. We don't see really any convincing evidence of ballistic emplacement such as fire fountaining or in this case water fountaining. Uh, we don't see it, uh, that doesn't mean it doesn't happen at the small scales, at the meter scales, it just doesn't happen at the a kilom a kilometer scale. We don't see any evidence on the rim and that's actually Pardon me. That's actually consistent with the impact models. And endogenic activity is more locally concentrated on the floor of Okator than it is on Martian craters. Pits are larger and more densely spaced on Mars compared to what we see in Okator and how this relates to uh, the interior. You know, uh, I invite people to, to speculate on that. Uh, and these are all part of the uh, nature communications and other related nature articles that are coming out on Monday, which have more details, of course, than I could share with you today. Uh, and I'd be happy to participate in any proposals that seek to use these incredible data sets uh, for future investigations of uh, uh, series. And I'll open it for questions, and then uh, uh, if we have time, I can move into stereo images. Thank you, Paul. Uh, much appreciated. That was really great. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any time for questions. Oh. Uh, <laughs> but, oh. But certainly we can do that during the discussion uh, right. period. Uh, because I'll be here. 
this talk is uh, last talk of the session and uh, discussion is about to start. So uh, certainly we can, we can uh, th there is a question I think in the uh, chat, I will uh, let Stuart uh, take care of that, but certainly we can do it during the discussion and also there's a uh, uh, topic um, Jim can talk about. So uh, Michelle, do you care to take over? Uh, sure, I can. Um, so, Stuart, do you want to talk with uh, start with the questions for Paul? I guess, or do you want to go back to previous discussion? I think it would make sense to uh, do Paul's while it is fresh in people's minds. Okay. Uh, so there are two questions at the moment in the chat for Paul. One of them is from Sean Gulick again. Uh, are these Akator flow features consistent with proximal ejecta that re-entered the crater during formation, such as terrace zone formation? Or is there another potential source for this material? Uh, that, um, I assume I'm still online. Um, Yes. Uh, that is actually an interesting question because I alluded to it very briefly. Uh, there's uh, strong evidence from the crater count distribution across the southern part of the crater that there's a high density swath that goes across it. And that uh, was interpreted as secondary, self-secondaries that came back across the structure. And that's actually supported by numerical simulations of the ejecta coming off of Okator uh, because Ceres is a pretty fast rotator, about nine hours or something like that. So uh, there's actually, the, the simulations actually show secondaries, but these are distant secondaries coming back across the crater, uh, forming uh, impacts as the impact melt is still solidifying. This, this would happen pretty quickly uh, within the hour or so after impact. I don't think there's, I don't think the simulations show any evidence that proximal ejecta would re-enter the crater, uh, like the flopping over uh, as it was forming. I, I think it basically just goes out. It, it's the distant secondaries that come back around. It, it's just the way the dynamics work, I think. I, did, I, I don't think anybody's discussed that possibility, but that's my impression from what the models show, the, the simulations. Okay, second of three questions. Uh, this is from Romina de Sisto. Uh, could you find any evidence of the type of impactor that caused this crater? Uh, she asks in relation to their own work uh, with Patricio Zane, uh, Wednesday talk, uh, where they found that the primary source of impactors on Ceres are outer belt asteroids that would be mostly type C. I'm not aware of any evidence that would indicate what type of impactor we had. Uh, the only possible way I think we might have that is the fact that the northern ejecta is relatively dark. And the question there is, is that because of the target material being different in the northern sector? Or is there some indication that maybe there's some contamination of the ejecta by the projectile? Because at five kilometers per second, maybe you could get a little bit more than you get on the moon, but um, there's no direct evidence that I'm aware of. It's pretty normal in its depth, uh, depth diameter ratio, maybe a little shallower, but not very much. So I don't, I'm not aware of any evidence that you could really use to pin that down very well. Okay, and the third question is from Anya Losiak. Uh, could you please explain why you do not see white salt deposits on the crater rim and why that is to be expected? Uh, the, the reason you might expect it conceivably is because of the mapping of terrestrial craters. The diagram I showed of Osin from Osinski that showed um, where hydrothermal deposits happen on terrestrial craters. Uh, the difference there is that uh, the impact velocity on Ceres is much lower, so the melting is, is more restricted to the central zone. Uh, so you don't actually get melting of water ice in the outer part of the crater. So you wouldn't be able to mobilize the brines in that region to deposit the salts on the surface. And that, it's a self-consistent story. The, the, the two things actually agree with each other. 